The book of Hebrews, as you already may know, was written specifically to first century Jewish believers in Jesus, proving the superiority of the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated over the old covenant that, of course, God used Moses to bring forth. And the main point of uh, this chapter 9, as well as chapter 10, is that the old covenant system was a temporary and an earthly system. But the new covenant is a heavenly and an eternal system of worship. The old covenant was an earthly system. It was just really a shadow of the new covenant heavenly reality. And the earthly tabernacle, and in particular, the Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies represented God's presence among the congregation of Israel. For example, in Exodus uh, chapter 25, God tells Moses that uh, he will meet with Israel in that sanctuary. And he says this specifically about the ark. And there I will meet with thee. I will commune with thee above the mercy seat. That's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that was made out of pure gold called the mercy seat. I will meet with thee and commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, uh, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he makes it very clear that it was over that Ark of the Covenant that God would manifest his presence among the congregation of Israel, and he would, uh, uh, he would make himself known. In fact, the high priest was not allowed into that compartment of the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. He was not allowed in there except on the Day of Atonement, one day out of the year. And uh, in fact, I think it's in Leviticus 16, Moses warns Aaron, do not go in there except on this one day or you will die. The Ark of the Covenant was the place where God visibly revealed his presence. With that in mind, Look now with me in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 4. And here is a description of the tabernacle. And in verse 3, after the second veil in that tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was, that is, this Ark of the Covenant contained the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, what we would call the Ten Commandments, I guess. Notice that. I want us to take a peek into the Ark tonight. I didn't say take a shot in the dark or take a walk in the park, but... Let's take a peek in the ark tonight. And I want to relate the contents. There's three of them. See them? Three things in the ark of the covenant that was in the tabernacle. I want to relate those things to us after we have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight that we can come together. <clears throat> thank you for just the, the truths that are contained in the this very passage. I ask that you would make it uh, very relatable to us and that as a result, our hearts would be really blessed as we consider these things that you have for us here tonight. We'll give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the 
things that uh, I think we're probably most familiar with that was one of the three contents of that Ark of the Covenant are the tablets of stone, okay? Remember, the first uh, stone tablets that God gave Moses on that mountain, when Moses got down to the foot of the mountain and he saw the idolatry that was going on around the golden calf, he was so disturbed and so angry that he threw those tablets down and they broke into many pieces. So it ended up that Moses went up again and he got a second a set of tablets. And uh, some believe that it wasn't like five on one tablet and five on the other tablet equaling 10 uh, commandments. But uh, some scholars actually believe there were two tablets because one was for Israel and the other one was for God. And they said the same thing. And normally what was done in that uh, ancient Near East is when a greater king made a covenant with a lesser king, he would put the stipulations down and uh, on a clay tablet and uh, the lesser king would take that, uh, that code and he would put it in his most holy shrine. And then the greater king, he would take his copy and he would put it in his most holy place. And so the wonderful thing is that God's the king of Israel, right? He's the king of that congregation. And he says, look, I'm going to give you my copy too. And I want you to be the caretaker of, uh, of the law that I have inscribed here on stone. But anyway, that's not what I want to say. What I really want to say is that according to uh, the, uh, the Jewish sages, rabbis, the ancient rabbis, they say that they think that not only were those uh, second, uh, that second set of uh, tablets put in that uh, Ark of the Covenant, but even the shards the, of the broken pieces were put in there as well. We don't know if that's true, but we do know that there was that second copy of what the Jewish people call not the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Words. What do those tablets represent? The ark contained those two stone tablets. What do they represent? Well, they, rep they represent the entire Torah, the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. And specifically, they are a revelation. And that's the bottom line. They are a revelation. But here's the thing. What are they a revelation of? Well, we could say they're a revelation of instructions uh, that God would give the people of Israel. That's true. But can I make it even more personal? Because that's what this revelation is. It is a personal revelation of God himself. The Torah the law that God gave his people that these stone tablets uh, really crystallize and represent is more than a list of do's and don'ts for these people to follow. Really, we should understand that, that these stone tablets represent a look at the person of God himself who gave it. The law of God, the Torah, really speaks volumes about who God is and what God is like. It's obvious that when you read, you understand he's a person who values holiness because he's the creator. He's unique from all of his creation. And so he demands uniqueness. He demands separation uh, uh, from people, and everything about him is righteous, and so he expects his people to be rightly related to him. You read the Revelation, and you find out he's a very loving God, and he's reaching out to people, and this is the way he's doing it. He's reaching out to people, and specifically the Jewish people, to be the means whereby he can 
reached to this entire world of humanity. He's reaching out to people so that they can know him. And so these stone tablets, first of all, they're personal. But when you understand that they are a revelation of this wonderful person that we call the God of heaven, they're also relational. Because this revelation is personal, it's also relational. The whole Torah system is really a divine object lesson of God's desire to restore sinful humanity and to bring them back into loving fellowship with himself. Have you ever viewed it like that? That's what the Bible's about. That's what the Torah is about. From mankind being cast out of the Garden of Eden to that high priest entering the Holy of Holies where the ark of the testimony rested and where God manifested visibly his presence among his people. These are all significant steps that require, that are required, you might say, that are necessary for God to make it happen, to make this personal relationship with him a reality. And then thirdly, these stone tablets, they're not only personal because they're a revelation of him. They're only relational because this person, God, he wants a relationship with mankind. But thirdly, and uh, probably most uh, misunderstood, they're beneficial. That is, God did not in the Torah simply give arbitrary laws to make life difficult for the people of Israel. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm glad I don't live in those days. I'm glad I don't have to follow the law of Moses. That would be a, a tremendous burden. And, and uh, they all knew it. But the creator knows how best to make human life meaningful and purposeful and safe and to extend in longevity human life. And so the Torah is given for Israel's good and in Israel's best interest. It's beneficial. There's a second content to the Ark of the Covenant. Not only the tablets, but if you look again in Hebrews 9, 4, there is a, a rod. There's a stick in that uh, Ark of the Covenant. It's, of course, Aaron's rod that budded, as it's said there in Hebrews 9, 4. Now, if you know the story, there was some contention among uh, the, the, the leadership in the congregation of Israel, and they were jealous of the leadership of Aaron. And so Moses said, all right, you, you guys, bring your sticks, bring your rods, bring your uh, you know, your, your staff, because they all had them. And uh, here's the deal. <clears throat> We're going to put them all in the presence of the Lord overnight. And in the morning, the rod that, that, uh, that buds and blossoms, that will be the God-ordained leader. Well, you know the story, right? <laughs> in the morning, they went in and they looked at all of these rods that were vying for leadership and authority. And the only one that budded was Aaron's rod. But not only did it bud, overnight it also blossomed and produced almonds. So it budded, it blossomed, and it, it was able to bear fruit. What is that? a symbol of. Here's a stick. I mean, a stick has no life in it. It's dead wood. And overnight, it was brought to life. To me, that's not revelation. That's resurrection. That's a picture of resurrection. That's life. That's miraculous power that is connected with the old covenant high priest and the sacrificial system, resurrection. Now, that reminds me 
of our great high priest. We know who he is. A priest, not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. A limitless life. He is the resurrection life. He is Aaron's rod, you might say. He is the miraculous power of life that is in us. Now, let's think about this for a moment. This rod represents resurrection, resurrection life. I mean, miraculous, powerful life. That's the kind of life that we get initially. When we get saved, that's like that rod forming buds on it. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 1 or 2 and verse 1 that when Jesus finds us, we're dead like that stick of wood. We're dead in trespasses and sins, but he quickens us. He puts his life in us. And uh, uh, spiritually dead, separated from the life of God, alienated from God, but then we are born from above. We, what the Bible calls born again, and we become the recipients. The spirit is life, and uh, we're born of the spirit, and we become the recipients of Jesus, who is eternal life. That's the budding of the rod. But that resurrection life doesn't end there. Remember, it also blossomed. So there is that initial, but there's that continual resurrection life. And for that, I want you just to uh, go back with me for a moment to Romans chapter 6 and just follow along as I read these verses, beginning with the fifth verse. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, Romans 6 and verse 5, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, verse 7, is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is that resurrection life blossoming. This is not the budding, not the born again, not the initial, but the continual. The blossoming resurrection life. It's that that Paul says in another chapter, it's it, uh, I'm dead, nevertheless I live. Christ lives in me. That's that blossoming resurrection life. Christ's life infused into you and then constantly pulsating within you so that you can do all things through Christ who infuses his life into you. But there's that third aspect of that rod of Aaron. Not only was that initial budding and that then that uh, blossoming, the continual resurrection life, but there is that bearing almonds. There is not only initial and continual, but fruitful. There's fruitful resurrection life where you are bearing. You're bringing forth. From life comes, springs more life. There's fruitfulness. And in the same sixth chapter of Romans, down in verse 20 to 22, he says, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Look at verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have fruit unto holiness and everlasting life. You bear fruit unto holiness. You're joined to the true vine. 
And with his resurrection life flowing into you, that life flows out through you. It's like Jesus said in John chapter 15, a great vine chapter. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bring forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There's a third thing in that Ark of the Covenant. Look again in, in Hebrews 9, 4. Not only was there that uh, those stone tablets and that uh, rod of Aaron that budded, there's also a golden pot or jar of manna. Now, you know what manna was, right? Remember when they were hungry in the wilderness? They, they, they needed food, and God miraculously provided for them this heavenly bread, really. It, it rained bread from heaven. Special, it's called, I think in, in one of the Psalms, angel's food. The real angel food, not the cake your wife might make. Manna. Um, that, to me, speaks of not revelation or resurrection, but of provision. Manna. It was a daily portion for every single Israelite. A daily portion for all. In fact, it had to be collected. And the amount was even specified. About two quarts per person was available every single day, except on the Sabbath, because on the day before the Sabbath, they were able to collect a double portion. If they collected a double portion on any other day besides Friday, it would breed maggots. But God kept it from spoiling. It was God's provision that had to be collected. You know, God's given us a lot of spiritual provision, and perhaps we haven't even begun to collect it because we're unaware of it. But we are told in Ephesians 1.3 that God the Father has blessed his people, all believers, with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. That's provision, but it has to be collected. For these Israelites to benefit they had to go out in the morning and they had to discover that manna on the ground as God's provision. Are you familiar with the provision that God offers to you as a believer in the scripture? It's incredible if you look into it. All spiritual blessings are yours in Christ Jesus. How many, how, how much of this spiritual blessing are you really partaking of? How much of it are you collecting every day? You have a personal responsibility as a believer to gather the provision spiritually that God offers, to make it yours, claiming it by faith. But remember, that manna not only had to be collected, but it had to be prepared. I mean, you could, I guess you could just eat it like a cracker off the ground, like a little piece of matzah off the ground, but that would get tiring. And so they would uh, come up with recipes for manna and they were supposed to prepare the meal that they would eat on the Sabbath of that manna on the day before when they gathered twice as much. You need to fix what you have gathered as God's provision. In other words, you need to put God's provision in an understandable and usable format because the Spirit provides for your daily spiritual life. So you need to collect it, but then you need to prepare it. Where it can be, where you understand this provision and it can be used by you in your daily spiritual life. Now, wait a minute. They had to collect it. They had to prepare it. But if it just sat on the shelf, they didn't have a refrigerator. But if it just sat there and they didn't digest it, what good would it be? It had to be digested. It had to be eaten. It had to be digested. They had to eat what they gathered for nourishment. You have to apply the provision that God has supplied you. You have to 
You have to digest it by accessing it and activating it by faith and have your life strengthened through it and fruitfulness flow out of your life because of it. So let's just tie this all up. When you're overwhelmed and you feel helpless, maybe you need to take a peek in the ark. Go back and look at what God, what you have in Christ, because all of that represents him. Take a peek in the ark. See the person of Christ there. See the resurrection power that is yours. See the provision that is yours through Christ. Everything about God accents his goodness. So take a peek into the ark at the very presence of God who promises never to abandon you, who reveals himself as a God that's always good, plus whatever he commands us through dependence upon his resurrection life in you, you can perform it. You can do it. So take a peek in the ark.